We're going to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 13. Let's bow our heads as we do. Father, we open your word now and ask that you would bless us, help us understand, and use the things we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start verse 1. On the same day, this is when his mother and brothers came because they thought he was completely crazy and they wanted to take custody of him, uh, and uh, he, he didn't go for that. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. He got into the boat and moved off from shore. One of the other gospels says, because of the crowd, the press of the crowd, he backed off from the shore. But I think it wasn't just the press of the crowd, because along the shores of Lake Galilee, up in the northern end, where he probably was at this point, there is a natural amphitheater in the hill. But the base where the platform area would be, the center of the amphitheater, is all an inlet of the lake. So to get to the acoustical center of that amphitheater hill, you have to move out into the water. Now, they knew amphitheaters in those days. Most of the big towns around the Mediterranean had a Roman-built amphitheater that they used for theatrical productions or community meetings, whatever. They knew amphitheaters. They knew how to project sound up to a... a, a, They knew how to make them steep, too. Because the steeper you make it, the closer the guys in the nosebleed section are to the speaker, right? They got some of you really close. (laughs) The one at Jordan Petra. It's not that steep, but it feels that steep. Uh, Almost like an amusement park ride. They're so steep. This hillside, uh, when I was there, our, our group from the seminary, we had somebody stand down by the shore. And we backed up the hillside fourth of the way, third of the way, on up the hillside, all the way up to the top of the hillside, we could hear someone talking in a reasonable voice, not shouting, from down by the shore. Uh, And and we estimated probably 30,000 people could hear you in that spot uh, pretty decently. Uh, it's It's a nice spot. And that's probably the spot where Jesus spoke this parable of the sower. Now, there are other parables that Jesus gives that talk about seeds and sowing and growing and reaping. Uh, and, and, and if you look at them, most of the time, we have our part in the sowing and the reaping. The growing part, you make your garden grow. I mean, we do some watering and things, we do some weeding and things, but I have never personally made any plant grow. I have encouraged them. I have begged them. I've done many other things, but I don't make them grow. I I do what needs to be done, and I take away what needs to be taken away, but I don't make them grow. And and as one of the parables says, it it grows by itself. The farmer knows not how. You don't have to understand how they grow to have them grow. You do your part. Our part's in the planting, the, the, the harvesting, and the support stuff. This parable here, goes into the growing from a different perspective than than most of the parables. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where there was not much earth. Immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns. The thorns sprang up and choked them. Others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. I remember years ago, a preacher at a camp meeting, I think, telling about the new house that they had moved into. And to save money, the landscaping wasn't done. They did not put sod down. We're going to seed it. Now, you can save quite a little if you seed your lawn, but it is work. So they got it all smoothed out and scattered the seed out there, and then they had a torrential rain. <laughs> torrential rain. Before the rain even, the birds saw the seed, and they were just picking the seeds off like crazy. Like, Am I going to have any seed left to grow? 
Then the rain came along and washed out corners of his yard, and there's little gullies in there, and there's spots where there probably was junk from the construction process just under the surface of the ground. And you discover this when it starts coming up, right? What's wrong with the grass over here? What's wrong with the grass over there? And there were plenty of weeds. Not every place, but plenty of weeds. I mean, you always have weeds when you're just putting grass seed out. You can't avoid it. There's weed seeds out there too. There might be some roots as well. Uh, around here in my yard, the uh, mimosa, little short, not tree, but the mimosa weed. Man, those things are tough. They come back from nothing hardly. And they come back big and they come back strong. And it's really hard to pull them out. They don't break easily. I mean, they're, they're tough. There's weeds out there made for Arizona. <laughs> they do good around here. Back to the lawn that the guy seeded out. See, there were, there were times he despaired of anything coming of that. But over time, as the grass came up, you start to mow it. The weeds started dying back, and the grass was prospering, and you fill in the dirt where it washed out and throw a little seed back in there. And the birds did not get all the seed, even though it looked like they were going to. And by and by, he got a good lawn, actually, a good lawn, even though there were moments where it didn't look like it was going to work at all. Those birds, hmm. any, any of you gardeners? There's some gardeners. I know there's some gardeners out here. Birds ever give you trouble when you're planting? Janesville, Wisconsin, we planted corn. Came out a few days later, it's not coming up. Take a look. I planted corn here, here, and here, and there's a hole here, here, and here. <laughs> Guess what? The birds don't have to dig the whole thing up. They just kind of walk along and go, yep, got your corn seed. They, they pick them out by smell, I'm sure. That's got to be by smell. Because they know right where to pick. So I said, why those rascals? So I replanted my corn. And I got some chicken wire. And I put it down. And I came back out in a few days. And right through the chicken wire, there was a hole here. <laughs> okay. If you want the chicken wire to keep them off your corn, you've got to raise it up. So they can't reach down to the dirt through the chicken wire. Uh, so I, I tried that here, and it worked a little bit. Uh, so this last spring, this, this year's spring, we had the best stand of corn come up for us we've probably had in our entire lives. Oh, man, it was a section like, like four rows and over a hundred seeds I put in every six inches right by where the watering hole is on the little watering line. One seed at each place, right? And there was probably four or five missed spots in the whole patch. It's like, yes! <laughs> and to keep the birds from it, we had a, a, a floating, uh, thin, spun cloth over the whole patch. So the birds didn't get any of the seeds. They didn't get any of them. And it came up great. I thought, Man, we're going to get the best corn patch we've ever had. Well, it has to more than just come up good. <laughs> it has to keep growing good the rest of the year. We did get corn. The corn tasted good. Short little stubby ears. <laughs> Turns out that, I don't know, maybe it was too wet from the two couple times that our hose broke and flooded that section of the garden. <laughs> there was a lake in there. And I, I don't know how long water ran a couple times, but I hear the water running in the house at a time that the irrigation is not supposed to be running. Oh! Go out and check and see, oh, yep, the hose broke. Turn off the water, and you know, a few minutes it went down, so it had drainage, but that could have set him back. Could have been nutrition in the soil wasn't quite right. It could have been that one end of the patch that I didn't finish digging the caliche out of, and there's caliche you know, about four inches down in there, and I'm hoping the roots get over into the deep soil. And I, you know, I don't know what all the reasons were. It was off to a really, really, really good start, but it was not the best corn patch we've ever had, because later in the season, other troubles came in to make the final product less than I was hoping it was going to be. That, that first 
man, they come up good. The moment. We've had moments when they didn't come up at all. And it looks like a complete crop failure. Some, some years it looked like you're not going to get anything out of your garden at all. This is going to be a completely dud year. We've always gotten plenty before the year was over. Right? But there are those moments where it looks like it's not going to work this year. I remember another time we lived in, in Minnesota. Driving past one particular granary. That, that had the, the uh, augers and shoots and stuff down into different bins, and some of the grain would spill onto the roof of the building, which had a rain gutter at the edge. And the seeds would slide down to the lower part of the roof or on into the rain gutter. Every year, seeds, a few seeds would slide down into there. Every year, a few more. You, you know what happens when that happens? The, the next spring, in the spring rains, <laughs> green all down the eaves drop, and up the ridges of the, of the roof until, as it says, the sun comes out for the summer. And it gets nice and hot. And then that stuff just and becomes compost for next year, for the next grain. comes out. Seasonal cycle, nothing ever came to fruit up on that roof. But in the spring, it was one of the first places to turn green in northern Minnesota. It looked nice. I liked to see the green there. But I knew it's dead end for that stuff. It's like the stony ground stuff. Not going to amount to anything. And it's nice to see the green, but that's all you're going to get out of it is that vision of green in the springtime. Stony ground. Some of you got caliche in your gardens too. I know you do. I think you do. Man, I got caliche in our garden. Whew. Yeah. Anyway, so a few weeks ago, Carol was saying, man, the flowers down at that end of this flower bed are not looking right. They're just not growing. They're not happy. Something's wrong. And I'm thinking, oh, I bet I know what's wrong. I got a little hurried when I prepped that bed, and I didn't get a lot of caliche out of that end. I know there's some stuff that's pretty close to the surface down there, and I just kind of poured dirt on top and hoped it would work like a, like a raised bed. <laughs> it wasn't working like a raised bed. It was working like there were plants on top of caliche. <laughs> so I finally dug it out. Yeah, there was caliche. I mean, there were rocks in the caliche, too. I mean, just real rocks. And then there's caliche that binds it all together. That was the bigger rock down under. There was not a chance of lifting it. After I got it out of the hole, I figured out a better way to get it out of the hole. The way I did it was it was deep where the rock came out, so I rolled it up onto the shallower part of the hole. And then there was another step there, so I put some rocks and stuff and rolled it up on that, and then I rocked it back and forth, a brick and a brick, a brick and a brick, a brick and a brick, and then rolled it out. Well, I finally figured out, I'm putting dirt back in the hole, right? because I'm going to make a flower bed out of it. Just roll it, dirt, roll it, dirt, roll it, dirt, roll it, dirt, roll it. Just have to roll it back and forth as it fill the holes. Like, huh? Next time, it'll be easier than rolling up the ramp and getting it out because I'm going to just roll it back and forth on the dirt while I fill it. So if you are digging caliche, it's just an idea I'm sharing with you. It might help. It might help. Uh, stuff growing with caliche under in Arizona, you can keep it going if you water it, just enough, not too much. That was the rhubarb. We watered that one too much. It, it, it had dug a little caliche out there, so there was some dirt in there. But when it started looking sick, we turned up the water. <laughs> now, that was the problem, was the water was standing in this like a bowl. Uh, and when we turned up the water, it croaked. But before it croaked, we turned it up some more. <laughs> Just in case that was going to No, it didn't help. Uh, it just dead as a doornail. And when we finally dug it, I was like, oh, well, that's it. We had fig trees that died that same way. Little hole, big tree, too much water, or can't get enough without it being too much. Or whatever. When you're sowing seeds, it's not precise where they're going to land. 
My dad explained to me how you sow seeds. I guess he used to do it when he was a kid once in a while, back on the farm in Michigan many decades ago. Uh, and, and if you're good at it and you learn to be, you, when you sling the, the, the handful of seed with your fingers, it kind of spreads between your fingers, and, and the way you throw it, it's going to spread out. And, and you want to spread it pretty evenly, not, not big streaks and not big patches. And, and with practice, you get pretty good at that. But along the edges of the field and some other places, you, you can't pick how many seeds are going to fall on this side of the line versus that. It, 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 you don't get enough to the edge unless you go a bit over. You've got to overshoot some. Some of it's going to land off the, the target zone by intention because you want to cover the whole field with the seed. Sowing is an old-fashioned method we don't do anymore. Nowadays, the computer and satellite working with your tractor's equipment can decide exactly how much fertilizer goes in this foot of row versus that foot of row or this foot of row or that foot of row. Satellite, it all changes automatically. You can set all that up. Not when you're sowing. Back in the old days, it was a, a little more uh, haphazard, maybe, we would say. Uh, then there were the weeds that some of the seeds landed in and choked out the plants. Now, in that case, the plants started growing. The plant was okay. Right? It's alive. It's, it's okay. And actually, the soil was okay, too. The soil was not defective. It didn't have rocks in it. It was good soil, except it had weeds in it. And the weeds overtook the grain, choked it out. Uh, that happened to us one year when we were living on the... Uh, uh, Pine Ridge Indian Mission and went to camp meeting, should have weeded the carrots before we went to camp meeting. I, I, I thought we'd weed them when we got back. <laughs> when we got back, there were weeds to be pulled. No carrots. The plants were just completely gone. They had died, withered down, and disappeared gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, weeds. Weeds can destroy your crop. <laughs> they can take the whole thing. Whatever part of the field they're, they're running, they'll, they'll take the whole thing. They'll take the whole thing. And then there was the good ground. That, that's why the farmer's out there. There is some good ground. And some of the seed fell in the good ground and brought forth a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, now, a hundredfold, that's phenomenal. Uh, Sixtyfold, that's great. Thirty is good. Good. How do I know that a hundred is phenomenal? Well, Genesis 26 says, That year Isaac sowed and reaped a hundredfold. It made the biblical record. They wrote it down. It's like, Whoa. Ever seen one like that? Wow, man, man, man. That's, that's, that's historic bragging rights in the scripture when you get a hundredfold. That's really, really, really good. Ever count? Most of you guys don't do this, all right? Ever count the, the kernels on an on a ear of corn? Anybody ever count the kernels on a corn? <laughs> really? Nobody ever did? Am I the, okay, I'll tell you how many there are. <laughs> On a big fat ear in our grocery stores these days, there's about 800 on one ear of corn. Most corn plants have at least one secondary ear. I'm guessing you get at least 1,000 for the one seed you planted. I can hardly wait to get to heaven and find Isaac and say, dude, you had a really good crop. You did, you did. I mean, and, and for whatever it was he was growing, a hundredfold was really good. I don't think I'd get a hundredfold of growing what he was growing. But I got to brag corn up to him. <laughs> Check out what sweet corn can do. Man. A thousand. A thousand for one. What a return. What a return. There is good, solid growth and crop at the end of the process.
Then verse 10 to 17, the disciples asked Jesus why he spoke in parables. And he said, it's been given to you to know the mysteries, but to them it has not been given. And then he talks about seeing they won't see, hearing they won't understand. It reminds me of a little saying in Chinese, I hear, but I don't understand. In other words, you know, don't, don't shout. It's not a problem of, of the volume. I heard what you said, but I don't understand what you said. Please explain to me what you're saying, because I'm not understanding it. Uh, and so Jesus is saying there are times when they don't understand, and I put it in parables, and, and it quotes from Isaiah. Hearing you will hear, verse 14, And shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. It sounds like God doesn't want them to turn back, doesn't it? I mean, that's that's the way it says it. Knowing God's heart, I know that's not really quite what he's saying. So what would he be saying? Well, uh, he wants to hide the meaning in plain sight. And why would he want to hide the meaning in plain sight? Well, when you have a parable, we remember the parable, right? I mean, we all remember the story about the seeds falling on the path and on the stony ground and among the weeds and in the good soil, the four kinds of soil. We know Jesus is talking about the response to the truths that he's bringing, in the hearts of the individual hearers. And there's different responses for different people. We we know that's what he's talking about. But Jesus is wanting to give this parable in a way that those who are spiritually attentive, whose hearts are in tune with him and whose ears are open and, and the Spirit is speaking to them, will be able to understand it. And the others will hear the story and not really get the deeper points. And he says, that's actually okay. Really? That's okay? Remember one time he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Now that's kind of a rough way of saying it. But there are moments where you don't want to share certain things with people who are not ready for it in their spiritual growth. I made the mistake of doing that in church one time. New, new, new perspective that just really, really blessed me, which I shared with the congregation, and a bunch of people weren't ready for it. They grabbed it and ran exactly the wrong way with it and started beating up on each other with it. It's like, huh. I had no clue. Probably should have, right? Probably should have. But I didn't realize people were going to hear it the wrong way, use it the wrong way, Because their heart wasn't at a spot where they could understand it the right way. And Jesus, I think, is saying there's times when they're not ready for it. And it's dangerous to give them the stuff they're not ready for when they're not ready for it. They're going to use it wrong. They're going to hurt themselves, hurt other people with it. We don't want that. Nevertheless, I need to give this information out so those who are ready can get it. How do I do that? Hmm. Package it up in a parable. Put it out there. Those who are ready, get it. Those who are not ready, don't get it. And it can sit around, waiting for them to become ready later, too, you know. Story's still there. Story's still there. I don't know, months from now, years from now, Spirit can bring it back. Say, remember that story? Time for you to think about that one, because you're ready for it now. And you'll understand it now, and you can use it wisely now. It will be a blessing to you. So the Lord is careful about what he shares with us, when he shares it with us, because he wants us not to be hurt by it. He wants us to be helped by it. But if he shares advanced stuff when we're not ready for it, or a different lesson we're not ready for yet, it can be truly harmful to us and others, and he really doesn't want that. So when they get into the house... Uh, the disciples asked him about why the parables, and, and then he went on to explain the, 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 the parables themselves. 
in verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches it away, snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one who receives the seed by the wayside, by the path, by the road, the sidewalk. Doesn't understand it. Just goes right past them. They see no value and they don't even hang on to it. It's just kind of in and out and it's gone. And, and the devil makes sure it's in and out and gone if we don't understand it. Uh, he has his birds there to pick up those seeds. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. What happens to this seed? Does it sprout? Yes, it sprouts. Is it real seed? Yes. Is it real sprout? Yes. Is it real plant? Yes, it is. The problem isn't the plant. The problem is the tin roof on the granary. <laughs> Where is that plant going to go? And it's not going anywhere. It's not growing. It's not staying. It can't. It can't. It's got no dirt. Got no roots. Got no support system. Receives it immediately with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but only endures for a while. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. He has no root in himself. That's kind of a key in there. The, the plant needs to have roots into ground that's going to remain moist through the hot, dry Arizona summer. A thin layer of dirt on top of the caliche, you work really hard to make that work, and it doesn't work very well because it's hard to get enough water consistently and not too much. So there is a problem, no root, no root in himself. Not, has not learned to lean on God for support in times of need. So when the crisis comes, there isn't any support system there, and it just collapses. It fails, dries up, withers away. The thorns. He who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. The seeds by the wayside don't even sprout. Or just take them while they're just laying on the surface. They're gone. Seeds on the stony ground sprout, and they grow briefly. And it's that nice spring green in, the, in spring. It, it does look good, but it's got no future. It's going to, as soon as it gets hot and dry, it's done. It's done. How about the plants among the weeds? Is it a real plant? Yes. Is it a healthy plant? Well, at first, yes, yes. It, 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 not a problem of the plant. It's a problem of the soil having weeds. And it grows for a while, too, depending on how weedy it is and other factors. I mean, they can go quite a while sometimes before they finally get choked out uh, and it comes to nothing. And uh, I, I was well along in my Christian experience when it, uh, somebody pointed out and it's like, oh, duh. <laughs> These are stages in a Christian experience. Everybody has to hear the word at first, and some of us receive it and some of us don't. Some people just wave it off, and others receive it, and it sprouts. But some don't, and it never even sprouts. But then if it sprouts and grows a little bit, if you don't have root, that's where the problem is going to come next. That's pretty little plants. They can go on farther with the weeds. And, and that's the place where I think I am in my spiritual life. I've gotten past the initial, are you going to accept Christianity or not? Does it make sense to you or not? Yes, it makes sense, and I've accepted. And I've gotten past the no root, at least some crises, I've made it through and, 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 and got some faith that God will take me through others. The, the one that hits me down the line in Christian experience is other things keeping you too busy, sucking up your time, 
sucking up your spiritual energy, sucking the life out of your spiritual life. Just other stuff filling up our lives. And so in a sense, it's the stages of growth of the plant have different risks involved. At that very first seed-only stage, the risk is that you won't value it at all and it will just be dis going to disappear from your life and nothing comes of it. The birds haul it off. And the next danger is not learning to trust God for the crises that are going to come, because they're going to come. They will. In fact, he has to let the little crises come to us because there's big crises coming down the line. And in order for us to be prepared for big crises, he has to let little ones beat on us so we learn to trust in him, put a root down a little deeper. <laughs> so the next time when it gets a little drier, you'll have a root a little deeper and you'll get through it. Uh, you learn, we learn by the experiences that God brings to us. And then there is the, the time when there is root and there is soil and there is a plant but it can get choked out by all the rest of the stuff of life. But then there is I think quite a lot of dirt that's really good dirt. And the caliche's been dug out and the birds didn't get the seed uh, and it's growing well, and the weeds have been chopped out, or we chop them out as it goes along. We, we keep ahead of the weeds, and we get a crop. In our garden, we always have produce. We finally decided we're not going to cover our tomatoes anymore this fall in case of frost, because if the frost takes them, <sighs> we've had plenty of tomatoes for what, almost five months. <laughs> you never got that up in the North Country. <laughs> We, we've had a, enough tomatoes, we're ready to let them go now. We've had crop. We've had good crop. Uh, and there will be good crop spiritually whenever we sow for the master. There will be a harvest. Uh, now, now I'm thinking, of, yeah, okay. Uh, our, our closing song uh, is going to talk about that a bit. So Jesus is telling us that between the, the, the sowing and the harvesting, and we have shares in all of that, there is the different stages of growth in a Christian's experience. And we need to, for our own selves, watch for that. And for others around us, watch for that as they come into those risk zones or meet those dangers so that we can help each other recognize you're on stony ground. You're in the weed patch. Watch out for the birds. Uh, so we can help each other get past those dangers and have a true harvest in our own hearts and in the hearts of others. We need to expect widely varied responses, Jesus is telling us. Quite different responses. Uh, and there are pitfalls which specifically target the stage of growth and development in a Christian's life. And, and there's different ways the devil targets us early in our Christian experience and late in our Christian experience. He, he knows how to hit us at the different stages most effectively. So freely, God will take care of those results. Uh, we will be involved in the process, uh, but it's him that brings the actual growth. And we need to be aware of predictable problems, predictable issues, and, and watch for them and devise ways to avoid the damage or limit the damage from the problems that rise. The four soils, four ways that people respond and different stages of response in our Christian experience. Uh, my, my prayer is that we will remember the story and that God will bring that story back to us uh, and remind us of those lessons. I get reminders of it every year in my garden. Can you tell? <laughs> it comes back. Uh, and we learn and we are reminded by the story that puts the lesson out there, hidden in plain sight, hidden from those not ready for it yet, 
but open to those who are ready for it, and yet still there for those who aren't yet ready, but will later be ready. It's there. It's there. He's, he's got the story planted, and it's going to stay there. It, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. If they come around, when they come around, the Spirit will be ready to say, remember that story? Here's what you can learn from that. Uh, we can all learn things that help us in our Christian experience as well. Lord, thank you for giving us stories that illustrate spiritual truths. Thank you for the story of the four soils, the different responses to your truth. By your grace, may we all be good ground soil, bringing forth a crop to your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.